everyone, everybody. We're just uh, welcoming everybody in here tonight to this event. I'm really happy to have you here. I think it's great that we're all in the same space to just share some knowledge and share our experiences. Um, just to kick us off, I am Sandra Collins. I am somebody who lived with a rare illness. I have um, von Hippel-Lindau syndrome or disease, depending on who you ask and what day. Um, so what it is, it's a rare chronic cancer condition that causes chronic tumors throughout different parts of the body systems. So yeah, quite complex, which I'm sure everybody is kind of aware of living with a rare illness or a rare disease that the complexities goes way beyond just, just the diagnosis. So it's great to have people in this space. It's great people to, to bring people together um, and various on, on both sides, people living with rare illnesses and then also you know, professionals in the space around research. Because the research, I suppose, is, is, is pivotal in terms of progress and development, but it's also really an important space to advocate for more resources and more supports. So it's, it's also, as somebody who lives with a weird illness, it, it's very, I'm very conscious that, that it's a space that is unknown to some people who's living with rare disease, illnesses or diseases because they're so used to just medical spaces or trying to catch up on their own support needs. But it's pivotal that we're in these spaces. So it's good today that we're talking about the reciprocity, like those relationship between back and forth with people lived experience and researchers to just come together to collectively walk towards change and transformative change in society. So a couple of housekeeping things tonight, you would have saw in our holding slide that we'd love everybody to turn their cameras on. But again, there's no pressure. You know, this isn't like school. We're going to ask you to read out loud, which is the, the new turn your cameras on for me, being a teacher in the space. Um, I am a community and youth work practitioner in Minute University. So I'm very open to inclusive spaces and open dialogue, but I'm also conscious that we have an hour and a half. So we'd encourage you to use the chat function as much as you can. If you have any questions at all, put them into that space and somebody will address them either throughout or at the end. Um, and what we would like, well, we would like, I think would be really, really important that if again, if only if you feel comfortable, that if you're introducing yourself in the chat function, if you can name the rare disease you're living with, and, and you don't have to, again, it's, it's all voluntary basis, but it would be really good to get a sense of who's in the room tonight for further projects or further pre uh, presentations or research stuff that we're, that, that's gonna be running. So yeah, so, so that's me um, in a nutshell really uh, fast, quick and easy. But again, encouraging everybody to, to get in and just being conscious that tonight is a really good space to share knowledge, share experience. And it, it's just a space for development. And one big thing I want to kind of mention is that this isn't a medical diagnostic space. So I'm not going to be able to tell you if you're on the right tablets or you're not on the right tablets. I'm not gonna be able to tell you or anybody in this space is gonna be able to tell you, you should be getting this scan or not getting this scan. So, so this isn't a medical diagnostic space. It's a very formal, informal space around walking together with researchers and medical professionals and walking and talking about the significant impact of living with a rare disease rather than medical advice. So just to kind of reinforce that for you, um, I'm not going to be able to cure anything tonight. That's for the weekend. Um, so, so yeah, so I'm gonna kick it off. I'm your chair for tonight. So I'm gonna chick, uh, kick it off and I'm gonna introduce Dr. Avril Kennan. Avril, has said, do a, do a short bio just because of time. So we're going to say Avril is coming in as the CAO of the Health Research Charities in Ireland. And Avril's going to come into this space just to give you a, a little glimpse 
of rare disease research that's happening in Ireland this right now. Sandra, thank you so much for that. Um, so yeah, I'm the CEO of Health Research Charities Ireland. We represent um, over 40 charities that have a strong focus on health research. And while we're not a rare disease organization, about a third of our members um, support rare disease research one way or another. M many of them are rare disease patient organizations. So we're leading on the running of this event on behalf of the forum steering group, the Rare Disease Forum Steering Group. And um, thanks to our colleagues who are involved in that as well. You'll learn a little bit more about them at the bottom of the agenda. Um, so I guess the first thing to say is that I don't need to tell you in this audience that living with a rare disease is very, very challenging. And I think sometimes when we think about research, it feels very, very slow and it feels maybe like a sort of ongoing promise that doesn't deliver. Um, but I guess there's a flip side to that as well. And, and that is that if there are any aspects of your particularly your medical treatment, but also sometimes your social care supports. And if there are aspects of those that are good, they are almost always, particularly in the medical space, they've almost always come from research. And while there are many, many challenges remaining, the answers in the future are also going to come from research. And so that's why we focus on it in the rare disease community. And in fact, a recent Rare Diseases Ireland um, piece of research revealed that 80% of people who live with a rare disease want op more opportunities to participate in research. So there is that good understanding of, of the value of it. And our focus today is research, but more specifically, it's um, public and patient involvement in research, or as we call it, PPI. So we'll be using that acronym throughout, but it means public and patient involvement. And what we're talking about there is not participation in a trial, for example, a clinical trial or being a participant in a, in a research study of some kind. We're talking about a really deep involvement where you are helping to shape the research, to shape the design of the research and maybe the dissemination of that research. Um, and the, the subsequent speakers are going to bring you different perspectives on that. Actually, we've got really excellent speakers lined up and they're going to bring you different perspectives on it. And they're going to explain a little bit more what that's all about. Some of you will be very familiar already and others maybe not so much. What I'm going to do just over the course of a few minutes is just take a little step back, first of all, to kick us off and give you a very broad overview of what's happening in rare, in the rare disease research as a whole, um, particularly things that have happened in the last year. It's going to move quite fast. So if you have any questions for me, stick them in the chat and I can pick them up in the chat or we can pick them up later on in the session. Um, I'm going to tell you about six different things. Two of those are at a European level. Um, so the first, and apologies to to anybody joining from the north, um, this European bit is, is, is not as relevant to you, but hopefully in time, it'll also make a difference for you. Um, the first thing is the European reference networks. Um, so what ERNs, we call them, and what these are is they're virtual networks that bring together rare disease healthcare providers across the EU in broad categories like skin, um, eye, lung, and so on. And they provide our clinical experts here with access to wider expertise. Um, and as they say, every rare disease should have a home in one of them. Um, they also will be important in development of care pathways and patient registries and so on. We have membership at 18 of 24 of them, so it's 24 in total, and this is coordinated by the National Rare Disease Office. Um, one challenge that has, so, the, so this has been happening for a while, but one challenge that has come up or it has become more obvious in recent times is that it's become clear that the Irish clinical sites who were involved are not being resourced fully enough to participate. Um, so very recently in, in the doll, NASA Horgan was asking the Minister for Health uh, about this and would there be more resourcing for the clinical sites. He was a little evasive on that topic, but hopefully we'll see more support for them soon because they're really, really important to us. Um, the other European initiative I want to talk about is called the Rare Disease Partnership. 
And this is something that is building on former initiatives to bring together EU countries to meet the the needs of the 30 million people across Europe that are living with a rare disease. Um, And what it aims to do is is the big ticket issues, the better prevention, better diagnosis, better treatment, and so on. And the plan is to do this through um, sharing of research and innovation knowledge so that research is that is happening anywhere in a European country, including um, in Ireland, it will be better and so that there will be a better use of data so that and we're not great at the data piece in Ireland but again this is this is pushing that along so that that people living with a rare disease can be found for research and if they choose to can take part in research and the PPI piece is very very important in in that rare disease partnership as well um the health research board the HRB and the national rare disease uh, office are playing leading roles for this in Ireland and the HRB will also be funding some transnational research um, through that mechanism. It's very, very early days. At the moment, they're just working out who the partners are going to be, what roles they're going to play. Uh, it's intended that the final proposal will go to the Commission in September and that it will then kick off in 2024. And I think this one is particularly significant because Ireland hasn't always been part of these things in the past. So it's really, really good to see that we're part of the mix this time. So then looking at things from a more local level, um, four research related things that have happened over the last year. Um, the first thing is related to the European piece in that the HRB have announced a new rare disease research and innovation catalyst award. I'm sorry for all the various titles, but bear with me. So there's the two European pieces. This is, they call it or DCAT. The cat- catalyst is, is the important word here. And the idea is that th- that through fu- funding, the they can act as a catalyst to increase our capacity to be involved in those European initiatives, the Rare Disease Partnership and the ERNs um, for the benefit of the rare disease research community here. And of course, ultimately for the benefit of people living with rare diseases. Um, They are expecting one application from a consortium with strong representation from different clinical and academic centres. Um, including the, the, the ERN leads, the clinical leads for the various ERNs in Europe. And they also expect very strong PPI. Um, again, very early days. I think that application is due to go in this month. Um, and it will, it won't fund individual projects, but again, it'll be more about how do we manage data? How do we manage undiagnosed patients better? How do we use research to get better at all this? And so it's very much about getting our house in order here so that we can avail of the other things we're involved in. The second thing at a national level is the RAIN initiative. Um, and this is an all Ireland network which is a collaboration between different types of researchers rare disease researchers and community groups and in the last year um rain got some funding from the irish research council to pr- progress their activities which is great and um, this is led by doctors sujes Sumanadan in ucd and professor amy j mcknight aj mcknight in queens belfast and supported very ably by helen mcanenny as well who many of you will know um there's part partner organizations north and south and the focus is on quality of life research in particular working to understand um, the challenges for young people and their families living with rare disease and they have an event coming up actually um it's an in-person person event with international speakers on june 27th and the focus of that will be on equity for people who live with rare diseases so unless somebody can get to it before me i'll stick in a link a link to register that event in the chat when i'm when I finish this piece. Um, separately, I note that AJ has recently been recruiting posts uh, in Queens to support the development of a rare disease carer support tool. And um, so to provide supports to carers of people with rare disease, which we know can be a very lonely role. Um, the third thing is something from HRCR, so that's something that we manage in, in conjunction with the HRB. This is the the HRCI HRB joint funding scheme. Um, and this is really interesting in that it gives our member charities uh, the opportunity to co-fund research with the HRB. 
Um, and we had 19 projects funded through that scheme last year. So a bumper number of projects last year. And actually over half of them were rare disease um, projects um, funded by seven different organizations. Uh, it's really interesting from a PPI perspective because the research is very much shaped by the charity. So they determine, many of them are patient organizations, and they decide what's important. Um, and then there's PPI throughout the whole process as well. I'm also mindful that it's not accessible to everybody. Um, it's only accessible to HRCI members, but more importantly than that, it, it's only accessible to, to groups that are charities and that can that have the funding to co-fund the, the, the research. Um, but nonetheless, I think it's really something to be celebrated that there were so many rare disease projects funded through it last year. And then my last thing that I want to update you on is a new genetics and genomics strategy, a national strategy. So this was launched just in, in December uh, with some funding to go with it. Um, we've known for uh, far too long that access to um, genetic testing and supports in, in Ireland are really not good enough. The waiting lists are so long, it will start to address that and also has a focus on research, looking to more personalized treatments for people with, particularly actually people with rare diseases and cancer and other conditions as well. But the rare diseases and cancer are the ones that, that always come up when we talk about genetics and genomics. Um, lots of potential for collaboration with the North there and Professor Mark Lawler from Queens was involved in the development of that strategy and various others as well. A national office has now been established to implement that and they are putting together working groups with one which will focus very strongly on PPI. So I didn't get everything important in but um hopefully that's given you a bit of insight into what's going on i hope i haven't lost you um siobhan will be telling us about something very something else very very important in a little while that i'm very excited about the new rare disease clinical trial network and one last thing to mention was the minister did also announce um, that we would develop a new national plan for rare diseases in february i haven't gone into any detail on that because um it's hard to see what's happening with that just yet, uh, but I think maybe we all need to put a bit, a bit of pressure on there and and make sure that that things do move along. He's on the record to say work has commenced, but I'm not sure what that is exactly. If anybody else knows, maybe you could um, pop that into the chat. That would be very useful. Um, so thank you very much. Um, lots and lots of hurdles, but also lots of initiatives. And I hope that ultimately we will start to to really feel the impact that they make. I'm going to hand back over to Sandra. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Avril. The last...
So just to start off by uh, talking about public patient involvement, which has been my privilege to be involved with for um, since really since 2010, since I was in DCU and we uh, established something called the Mental Health Trilogue, which was gathering people with mental health difficulties with lived experience of conditions alongside clinicians and service providers, alongside, importantly, families and carers and those responsible for supporting people with mental health conditions. So I suppose since then I've been working in this space and my observation as a researcher is this is the best possible way to work and I don't think I could work any other way now to be honest other than really co-designing research with the people who have lived experience of the healthcare condition are with people who are responsible for implementing uh, health service change and indeed health policy change. So firstly thank you for spending uh, your evening with us this evening and for, uh, for coming to, to listen and to engage hopefully in dialogue as to what PPI is and how PPI can, can serve you. Um, so there's a shot there of our young experts by experience uh, from the patient organization 22Q Ireland, which is a charity that supports people living with the rare genetic disorder 22Q Ireland. And it's been my privilege and pleasure to support the, the charity as, as a PPI researcher for the last eight years. And as you can see there, we have a a lot of fun and research can sometimes seem really dry and overly serious but um, ultimately it is fundamentally about uh, relationships it's about co-creating knowledge and it's about uh, implementing that knowledge in ways that can uh, fundamentally improve life for for children for young people for parents and indeed for uh, people right across the the age range and throughout the lifespan um, so uh, what I'll talk about this evening, I just want to touch on where I'm speaking to you from this evening, uh, the University of Limerick and the PPI Research Unit here, which has been established for the last 10 years. I'd like to just touch on the different types of research involvement, because I think that's helpful for us just to develop a little bit of a consensus about what we mean when we talk about participation in involvement. Um, I'll, I'll talk about the typical research process and how that's different in PPI partnerships. And I'll look at an in-depth case study of PPI with a rare disease charity. I'll then touch on the national PPI Ignite Network, which I think is just an absolute game changer for us in Ireland. And I know a lot of other countries are actually looking to Ireland now with, uh, with envy because we have such a powerful national vehicle to advance PPI collaborations. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the typical supports that you can expect if you do choose to become involved in PPI partnerships, as well as some helpful introductory guides to start your PPI journey. Um, I, I would love if you would use the chat uh, to perhaps post any comments or any questions as we go through this presentation, because um, if you're anything like me, you hear something, it sparks a thought, but then by the end of the presentation, it's lost. So do feel free to pop questions or comments into the presentation. And at the end, I'd love to hear, as I'm sure we all would, do you have any experiences around living with a rare disease or caring for someone living with a rare disease? that you think is important for researchers in Ireland are indeed indeed researchers across Europe and internationally to begin looking at uh, in, in more depth in collaboration with, with people living with the condition and with families. Um, so that's what we'll talk about. Uh, the research unit here in the University of Limerick to kick off, there's a, a picture of our Murray crew. Uh, we're six and uh, there's a, a, a lot of experts expertise in the unit, uh, which has been set up for the last 10 years in uh, an approach to research, which is known as participatory health research. And that really is very well aligned with PPI. So it's a broad umbrella term, which basically means all the researchers who identify as participatory health researchers are absolutely committed to reducing the power imbalance traditionally held between researchers and medics and patients and families to make it much more of a level playing field so that we're all partners together in a co-production collaboration. 
Um, so it's also a World Health Organization designated collaborating center for migrants and refugees and their involvement in health research. The center here also has developed over time strong national partnerships with HSC, with the Department of Health and indeed with the Health Research Charities Ireland. Um, we're, an, we're a strategic partner for an international centre, which is the Collaboration for Participatory Health Research. Uh, very excited to be launching a new postgraduate in public patient involvement. And just to flag to people, if you do have budget for training, I think this is well worth investing it in this particular course because it's going to be an online course. It's a blended course, which makes it very doable. Uh, and it's also at level nine. So it's at a, at a postgraduate level. Um, and if you're really interested in becoming a champion for PPI within your charity, within your organization, or just being able to really speak with confidence about all of the models and theory and structure that does underpin PPI, um, this is a, a very useful postgrad to, to consider. And University of Limerick has been a lead site uh, for the last uh, six years for the National PPI Ignite Network. We were an original site for the first uh, PPI Ignite Network and um, we're in our second round uh, now of, of, of membership of that. So I'll speak a little bit more about that. There are some of our partners. Um, and uh, to, to kick off, I suppose, traditionally, you know, there's been a lot of hierarchy in the world of medicine where the patients defer to the expertise that the doctors have. And it's very similar in research. Traditionally, research subjects or research participants would defer to the expertise that researchers have. But in recent years, we've really come to understand that there are different types of uh, engagement in research. The first type is what we would probably term research participation. It's the traditional type where patients are giving data to researchers. Now that data can be the spoken word it, in terms of interviews or focus groups. It can be uh, biomedical samples like blood samples or genetic material or it could be you know, community consultations like focus groups, et cetera. But, and, and that is a very valid and important form of research. Um, there's also research engagement, which is researchers communicating out about their research where they've conducted the research and they want to share the results to impact and improve health services, to improve health policy. Um, and again, the type of research activity would be outreach, it would be educational activity, it would be stakeholder engagement. So the typical conference presentation seminars, etc. And again, that's a very important research activity. But both of these research activities can be and should be informed by what we term involvement. And that is the collaboration of researchers with patients, with public, with stakeholders as partners, and importantly, as decision makers across the research cycle. So if there was to be a litmus test for are you involved in a genuine PPI collaboration, I would ask what decision making ability or what decision making power am I being given in this research partnership? And if the answer is, well, none, I've been told what to do or none, my opinion has been asked, but the researchers are ultimately making the decisions, then I, I think I'd query is, is that PPI. Now, I want to acknowledge that there are some research studies where it isn't appropriate to offer decision making ability to uh, stakeholders who are who don't have expertise in a research subject area. So I'm going to go on now to have a look at the different uh, examples and um, opportunities that could be offered to PPI uh, partners across the stakeholder cycle. So um, this is a typical research cycle, uh, just to simplify it, the researcher generally identifies the research area or topic, the researcher generally designs the research study, the researcher gen generally carries out the research, analyzes the research results, and the researcher would take responsibility for pu publishing research.
with these unmet needs, but we need good research in order to be quantify, qualify, and importantly, advocate for the service improvements. So if we fast track um, seven or eight years, we're now at a point where we've developed a, a panel of young experts by experience who are now so highly esteemed by the international patient organizations and indeed by partner organizations that just last year they funded all of us all of the, the, the research team and all of the, I think there was seven uh, young experts by experience who were flown over to Croatia and put up an accommodation and who were keynote speakers at a conference. And I think we need to get there to that parity of esteem where it's understood that yes, the science and the latest research and developments are very important, but what is the point if we are not including the patient population impacted by our research to help us understand how meaningful or otherwise is, is our research? So let's take a little bit of a, a deeper dive into what uh, we did um, in our partnership with 22Q Ireland. Um, so it, it began with a, a literature review of the evidence, and that's always so important, no matter where your patient charity is on the journey to first First of all, uh, invest in collating the existing evidence because otherwise you'll waste your time commissioning research or putting forward research proposals that already exist. And um, from that, we identified um, a number of important uh, research topics that the patient charity decided would go ahead and that uh, led to successful research funding grants and if people aren't already aware of the Irish Research New Foundation grants or, or small grants like that then um, I suggest that you do link in with the health research charities and Sarah and the research officer there to become more aware of the small grants because it's a little bit like Lego research you begin with small building blocks and then and you can get bigger and bigger in terms of your ambition for what you can achieve for, for your population. So we looked at transitions, social skills, mental health, psychosocial programs, and uh, we've just currently finished a seven-year review of our P P uh, PBI collaboration that we're hoping to publish on soon. We uh, engaged very much in developing relationships with the lead hospital consultants and the clinicians. And I think that this is a population that we often forget when we're talking about successful PPI, because again, uh, the researchers and the patients and families can only go so far, but it's the health service managers and the clinicians who need to implement the research. Um, and so we collaborated uh, to set up something called Clinical and Research Advocates or 22Q CARA, and that ultimately ultimately uh, has resulted in successful submissions to the health services executive um, for uh, service development. So um, moving over here, the, what is that service development? Uh, development? We have um, established a paediatric clinic in CHI Crumlin, and there's a fantastic lead consultant there, Dr. Suzanne Keller. We've established a transition clinic in St. James's, and Professor Mary Louise Healy is leading out on that. And importantly, the patient organization assists and supports families at those clinics. So there's a real integrated care approach there. There's uh, been a great improvement in mental health care and psychiatric assessments and psychosocial support programs. Um, uh, in terms of patient registry and, Asian, and evidence review, we've secured um, national grants for project consultancy, for facilitation, for networking and for proposals. So if we look at, well, what role have the patient charity played in terms of the PPI process? They've been a driver of research. They've co-designed the research process. They've seed funded the research. They've recruited participants. They've ensured that the research materials are accessible for, for everybody, parents and young people. They've always sense checked what emerging themes are coming out from our research. They've advised on the real life implications for patients and family. They've importantly communicated the research into digestible
and one researcher. And what I'm delighted to share with you this evening is that there is now a national PPI Ignite network that's been established. And there's over, in fact, I think the slide is out of date. There must be at least over a hundred partners now involved. There's seven universities, there's 53 local partners, lots of national partners, including HRCI, who are really working very hard to ensure that PPI informs all of these work packages that you see here on the right. Um, I know I'm running out of time here, so I just want to direct you to the website here, ppinetwork.ie, where you'll have the opportunity to engage in opportunity, uh, engage in matching opportunities, um, to learn uh, and access a lot of freely available resources and to learn more about PPI. There's a lot of very interesting guides uh, that you'll find um, on the website, for example, Making a Start, which HRCI led out on with TCD around how to uh, develop um, a toolkit. Um, our own partner here in the University of Limerick Care Alliance has published a guide for not-for-profit and community groups new to research. And there's very strong values and principles underpinning the PPI Ignite network. I include this slide about the three characteristics of both contributors and researchers because I just think it's so interesting how they really align. It's really about communication, it's about respect, and it's about the investment of time. So I'll, I'll close there and I'd really welcome um, if you want to pop in the chat any comments, questions, or if you've any experience related to living with or caring for a rare disease that you think should be priority for researchers to explore with the patient and partners. I'm sure that will be helpful to the Rare Disease Forum to consider Thank you. Yeah, no, that, that was great, Lauren. It, it's, it's great to just get it because it, it, it kind of breaks down some of them barriers to around research and like, oh my God, it's so scary to get it to get in. To get involved in to get to get a look at and, and i'm just conscious that i'm not in that chat so I, I i probably will put my input in there but what i would really love to see which is which is the community new worker in me who lives in a space of equality and inclusiveness is a little bit more around engaging those communities who are harder to reach in society because people who are well able to advocate for themselves and speak up for themselves are, are engaged in those medical spaces already, but there's actually a cohort of people who, who aren't engaging in those spaces. And I think researchers might need to do a little bit more work in terms to actively engage and, and, and how do we implement and to get them engaged and how do we make it more accessible and not just disability focus accessible but actually a welcoming and belonging space so I think that's really really good which leads us into the next space and um, our next guest speaker is, is Stacey Greenis who's who actually has has lots of um has lots of uh I'm trying to say experience in this PPI um, research space and has, has done lots of work and and Stacy is a patient partner with the charter for arthritis research in UCD and she's Europe she's I'm with the European League of Against a Rheum Rheumatism right am I saying that right Stacy sure. yeah thanks and Stacy is a big believer in the space for Patients and public voices should be at the heart of every healthcare space and policy and research going forward because that's that's the key to transformative changes. And she's a huge advocate for early diagnosis and around access to medicines for all patients and for the progression of an integrated multidisciplinary approach to care. So lots of experience. And, and also somebody who lives in this medical space along with any people living with rare diseases. So, and so it would be really good to get your input here, Stacey, and just hear from you. Um, so welcome into the space. 
Thank you. Thank you, Sandra, for a lovely introduction. I'm a, a bit embarrassed, but I'll, I, as Sandra knows, um, she's met with me before and I have a bit of an ego and I'm going to introduce myself again. So I'm Stacey. I'm five foot seven. I sit here in front of you this evening with brown hair, blue eyes. I'm wearing glasses and I have a summer dress on um, and I have nice flip flops and lovely colored toes getting ready for UL and Limerick for the PPI summer school and I identify as she or her and if someone in the room lets me know I can quite easily identify as them also and I'm offering this as an inclusive um, introduction and hope that potentially some of you in this virtual space will use this introduction going forward um, and thank you to Sandra and to the health the, the, the form and health charities research Ireland for having me here to speak this evening so next slide and there if you just quickly go through all those um, little bits on the next slide for me, that'd be great. So a little bit more about me is I'm daughter to Noreen. I'm a sister to Alan and Colin. I'm a niece and a cousin to Manny, and I'm a godmother to Cuiva and Rory. I'm a friend to all humans and animals alike. I'm a colleague to Manny in the research space. And of late, I've been called a troublemaker, and I quite take that very affectionately and have a new theme tune, Trouble Troublemaker, that's my middle name from Dolly Moore's song. I've also been called a wagon now lately, and I suppose now I really know that I'm hitting the very home at the, the getting to the core space when people realise that they're giving you these affectionate terms. The term that I really identify with is an advocate and an activist. And I suppose what you probably haven't seen anywhere in this is patient. Um, and I, the only time I identify as a patient is when I'm in front of a healthcare professional, my GP, my doctor, my physio, etc. So next slide. So Lorna gave a very good introduction into what patient and public involvement is. But for me as a patient, um, PPI is research carried out by um, members of the public um, rather than to, about or for us. And involvement in research has a moral purpose. People have a right to have um, a say in decisions that's going to have an impact in their life. And I suppose I have been involved with Disability Federation Ireland um, many years ago, and I'm also involved with Independent Moving, Living Movement Ireland. And models within these organizations is nothing for us without us. And that's really, really important and crucial in the research space, I find also. So next slide. Um, so I'm more, I'm more like the term responsible um, research and innovation, RRI, because it's more inclusive, I find. And RRI came out of a key action of the science with the society program under Horizon 2020. And I find this to be more inclusive because it looks at ethics, gender, governance, open science, public engagement and education around science. Um, during that funding program, 50 million annually went into the investment around this. And it's been brought forward also into Horizon Europe with a focus on the EU sustainable development goals. And health is a huge aspect within this but also citizen science. And that's why I really, really like um, responsible research and innovation. So next slide. So I thought I'd give you a bit about what I bring to the PPI table because there'd be many of you here that start on their journey and see what you can potentially look at for yourselves, what you can bring to the table. So next slide. I bring an awful lot of experience from rheumatic muscular disease medications and other treatment options. So I live with zero negative, non-differentiated rheumatoid arthritis um, and have had many different tests in the rare disease space because often people with this type of diagnosis um, have varying waves of, of, of symptoms and connects back into something in the rare disease space. But also I have hemochromatosis and I'm one of many in my family that does. But within the medication side, I've been, I've been known to have lots and lots of medications from oral medications to topical medications to subcontinuous um, medications. So over the years, I've had everything from analgesics to NASDAQs, corticosteroids to biologics 
um, and, and other forms of DMIRDs. But also on the other side of things, I've had other treatment options, such as physiotherapy, occupational therapy, ophthalmology, surgery. Next slide. The other thing that's really been pivotal in my um, time as a patient is medical devices, um, such as apps. Um, this is the heart screening there on the right. I also walk with crutches and I have a chair when I'm really, really unwell. And often I use that also as a self-management tool. And then there's a pain machine in the middle. Next slide. Self-management has been a huge part of my journey and I've highlighted the recommendations there around self-management from Euler um, in 2021. The self-management toolbox, but also different complementary therapies that I bring in, have, I have tried really, um, from yoga to water therapy, to massage, to counselling, to meditation, to breath work. Um, so all of them sort of things have given me a great journey to be able to speak from a holistic care point of view, an integrated care point of view, access to medicines, um, problems around taking medicines, and um, different devices that I've used, and lots more, um, but we don't have the time to get into it. And every day I find is a learning day, and I'm really thankful to two fantastic women along my journey, Mary Healy and Claire Kenevy, the brought self-management to Ireland and really we have an awful lot to thank them for it because they've taught me education is really really critical and important and each day I go out into the space to learn as best as possible what I can to improve my life but also the lives of others. So this talk tonight I was asked to, to, to highlight some problems in the area. Some of you may have some problem, have problems in this area and some might have experienced these. I'm not the one to sort of focus in on problems. I'm more solution driven, orientated person. So some of the problems might be that you might feel taken for granted, have been feel undervalued, taken your time's taken for granted, your experience, assumptions made for about you in one way or the other. You may be asked to do things that you're uncomfortable and may not align with your values, beliefs. Um, or morals. Um, you feel like you might be heard. Um, they're not hearing what you're saying. They're ignoring you. They're misinterpreting and, you know, taking your words, ideas and opinions in a different way. Um, and sometimes there's often the toast tokenistic side of PPI and people's what they say versus what they do may not align in the space. And then they may not make reasonable accommodations for you to be able to attend meetings or join um, freely. And also some people don't create a safe space for you to um, physically or emotionally. Next slide. So with the, those problems in PPI, I thought then about the barriers and I thought about all the different stakeholders that are involved in PPI. And these are the barriers that I could see throughout all the different stakeholders, whether that's from our side patients, patient organizations, universities, clinicians, researchers, so on and so on. So there's the individual personal factors that we all have as barriers, um, perceptions and attitudes, communication and how we communicate, lack of training, the different power dynamics. And often this is a huge one because people are so tied to what they believe and don't want to let go of the work that they have been doing to bring other and new voices in to make it better and then feeling not heard or valued in the team. Next slide. So my involvement. So I'm a partner in research and what I do is I bring my experience to the table. I'm not data um, and I contribute to decisions about design, conduct and reporting and research. And thank you to Emma Doris for the research onion. So Within the research owner, there's many different layers. And um, within these layers, I specifically keep in the dark blue areas. And these are the areas where I'm able to make decisions, share decisions. I'm involved in co-production, co-design and collaboration. I'm involved in committee levels. I'm involved in stakeholder dialogue and also ensuring that I'm getting the best within this space and how I can best influence it as possible. And really that's the big test about PPI is how you can influence within 
this space. Next slide. So the examples I'm going to highlight to you this evening is the UCD Centre of Arthritis Research. And the UCD Centre of Arthritis Research set up the Patient Voice and Arthritis Research. And it, it has been fantastic. And I have to thank Professor William and Emma Doris for leading the initiative. And they did this because they seen that there were needed patients at the heart of the centre. And by doing that, they restructured the centre to have three patients involved in the 10 steering committee, 10 member steering committee. And I actually sit on one of those seats now. And that's crucial because I'm involved in the day to day decisions around governance and on what happens within the Centre of Arthritis Research. But you can see the research cycle there and also Lorna um, highlighted a research cycle in her presentation. So the key in our research cycle is research prioritization and um, research PPI training and um, the importance of funding applications, facilitating participation over monitor, oversight and monitoring and then evaluating and disseminating. So within my role, I'm involved in the day to day governance side. I'm involved in outreach activities such as our seminar series, the conference, um, annual conference, but also I'm a co-applicant in research um, and liaison in many different things in relation to that. Um, we also have a research advisory group. I'm involved in recruitment of different people within to the center. And also we have disease registries. Next slide. So I highlighted the importance of research priorities. And I suppose this is huge because this was a study that was done with UCD, Centre of Arthritis Research and Arthritis Ireland as a key priority here in Ireland. Um, and was led jointly by three patients, myself, Stephanie and Carmen with three researchers. And we looked at all the different ways that research needs to be made a priority in this area. And we came together, looked at the literature, looked at the different methods, put together different questionnaires and surveys that went out into the whole community and was different ways in how to be disseminated. The results came back, um, reviewed the results. We got PhD students to analyze those results for us, how we wouldn't bias it. Then out of that, then we came together at priorities, went out then into the community again, and the community then prioritized all the different things that they felt were crucial for research and came up with 10 key priorities. And that's how all the research that we conduct now um, feeds into the, these 10 key priorities areas based on what the society in Ireland have decided was important. Other crucial things that we do is we also link in with rare disease and it's all really important for the centre in this space. We'd like to be able to do more, but I suppose it's very difficult for us um, because within Ireland, we have the lowest number of rheumatologists in, the, in, in Europe and often they are seen dealing with clinic, uh, patients within the clinic side. So research sometimes has to take a back for them. But some of the key things we have done is we have been linked in and shown the importance of rare disease days around different um, initiatives such as the chronic non-bacterial osteomyelitis and also um, they've also linked in with 22Q11 and a presentation around awareness. Next slide. Stacey, I just want to give you a bit of a time check there. So you probably only have about two, two minutes, three minutes okay. max. I'll fly. So this is the study that I've been involved in in UCD, and it's a study in relation to PAM. And I'm a co-applicant to this with Professor Wilson, and I'm involved in the design and redesign of this and helped with the writing of it from I'm reviewing it for funding. And I'm involved in all the decisions around this and the different methods and protocols, the research advisory group and how we're going to communicate this research back out into the community. Next slide. So this is another piece of work that we've done on the rare side of things. And thank you to the, the families that have taken part in this. And it's the and Bichette study. 
and an Irish family um, by coming forward and getting tested, we found a rare mutation um, in the area of Bichette's and it's also being collaborated across other centres uh, across the world. Next slide. So on the European side of things, I um, just want to highlight to you that there's a number of different European studies that the centre is connected with. And one is the Hippocrates project. Um, it's a 20 million project in the area of sciatic arthritis. And there is patient partner in relation to that through the centre, but also other patient partners throughout Europe through Euler, the European Association of Rheumatology. And the project that I'm um, partnering with, with through the centre is the Squeeze project. It's a um, 12 million funded project. And basically it's about squeezing the best out of medicines in the area of rheumatoid arthritis. And we have 13 partners across Europe and we're looking at the data of about 30,000 through registries and electronic health records. And things that I'm involved with there is the management side, the data science, the protocol, the precision medicine side of things, models of care, trial designs and all that. Next slide. I like to highlight the importance of patient reported outcome measures and the area that for us is the um, AMARAT and outcome measures in rheumatology. And this is crucial for organizations to link in with because it creates domain sets. And this is really, really impor important for regulatory approval for new treatments. Next slide. I'd like to th thank the the HRCI and HRB for the joint funding applications. I suppose I was also involved in this um, through the centre. We weren't awarded it um, for our project that was moved forward. Um, and congratulations to Professor Susan McDonough for her project. But it's amazing what comes about. I'm now a participant on um, the Be Active with Arthritis Ireland exercise programme. And that's coming. I'm, I'm now asked to be a participant and feeding back research through that. Next slide. Sorry, say, so we're just going to have to kind of wrap it up there because we still have Siobhan to come behind you there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So Stacey, you sound like a busy woman, busy woman uh, involved in lots of stuff. But I suppose what I want to reinforce with the people who are here today Stacey's, Stacey's involved in this and she's she's been involved in this for, for a long time. So she she didn't just come in and, and be involved in that level of, of research and participant. That there's been lots of support and encouragement along the way from researchers and particular organizations to help bring her up to that space. So although it sounds, and, and it is extraordinary,
So thank you so much, everybody, um, and thanks for the opportunity to speak. And uh, thank you for everybody who's still on the call on this nice summer evening. Um, I promise I will try and stick to time um, this evening. And actually, now, um, Stacey, you've set the tone, so I'm just going to be really, really quick in terms of in improving the inclusivity of my introduction. So I'm sitting here with blonde hair and brown eyes, a polka dot shirt, and a plant behind me that's seen better days given the heat this week. Um, but anyway, so um, I'm going to give a really quick update this evening on the Rare Disease Clinical Trial Network with a special focus on PPI. And I've recently just come on board as the PPI liaison for the network. Um, and this is actually a dual role shared with the Health Research Charities Ireland and UCD so that we can really um, use all that experience that the HRCI has to embed PPI across our network. Um, so some of you may already be a little bit familiar with the network because my colleague, Professor Rachel Crowley, spoke last year at this event when we were just starting out. Um, so tonight I'm going to give a little overview of the network, who we are, what our ambition is, where we've come in the past year, and then kind of a bit of a deeper dive into our PPI plans. So um, I thought that I would just start. Has that moved on? Oh, yeah, perfect. OK, I thought I would just start with um, a little bit of an overview of what is a clinical trial, because maybe not everybody on the call is familiar with that. So really, they're the studies uh, in humans of different types of healthcare interventions. And that's just an umbrella term for different things like medicines and um, surgery. So getting your appendix out or a stent in um, different types of devices. So it could be, you know, getting an inhaler or using your inhaler, uh, different types of therapies, for example, physiotherapy, psychotherapy. And ultimately, the aim is to see what effect these have on health. And they don't always have to be new treatments or interventions they can also be just different ways of using ones that we already have or using them in different populations um, so in terms of then a network it's all the different people and, and players that have to work together in order to answer those questions in clinical trials so we have um, healthcare professionals hospitals scientists academic institutions, like your universities, um, industry play an important role because a lot of the time they're the ones that kind of are developing the medicines or the devices. And also the regulators are important in that they make sure that we're doing the trials according to best practice and keeping the patients safe. And of course, then patients and patient advocates play a really, really central role in the network. And they actually have a dual role because a lot of the time they're the participants, so they are um, being involved in the study and actually being investigated. And then they're also then, as we've heard tonight, in terms of PPI, the collaborators. So um, we have like, like a lot of different roles there for the patients. So in terms of who we are then, we were funded by the Health <coughs> Research Board as a network aiming to increase the quality and quantity of rare disease clinical trials in Ireland. So through collaboration with patients, researchers and industry, we support the development of rare disease clinical trials here in Ireland, the trial methodology and researcher training, because sometimes um, how you run a trial in other areas, uh, other disease areas may not necessarily be the same for rare diseases. So we want to kind of build capacity in that area, too. But importantly, we keep the patient voice at the center of everything we do, which is why we're really focused on embedding PPI from the very start across the network. And we have a lot of different partners in the network, um, both nationally and internationally, but our core team has four members. It's Professor Rachel Crowley and Professor Cormac McCarthy. There are two clinical leads. And then Brenda Malloy is our network manager and I'm our PPI liaison. So I just wanted to say that before the network actually was established, there was already a lot of work happening in rare disease research in Ireland. And it was, you know, at a national and international level, it was happening across different sectors. And, you know, we have patient organizations, different government or agencies, uh, academic institutions, charities. And so really the purpose of the network is to try and consolidate all of these efforts and really build a collaboration hope that links with international expertise and also makes Ireland kind of world leading in terms of patients having access to rare disease clinical trials. Now, I know that we have a couple of people on the call, probably from the North, Northern Ireland. Um, so I just wanted to add this in that um, at the moment, we don't have any official partners from Northern Ireland in the network. 
But there is a lot of rare disease research happening in the north. Now, Arvel already mentioned the RAIN network, which is an all-Ireland network. Um, but in addition to that, there's the Northern Ireland Rare Disease Partnership, which has um, research elements in there. Queen's University Belfast are involved in a number of different partnerships, and they're in the RAIN network as well, and uh, the Redress Partnership. And Ulster University, Ulster University have the Ulster University Alliance Against Rare Disease. So there's a lot happening there, and we really do recognise the importance of keeping those lines of communication open. And so for that reason, Professor Crowley is actually um, a member of the working group for the, Rare, the Northern Ireland Rare Disease Partnership, and she represents the P Republic of Ireland, so that there will hopefully be opportunities for us to collaborate and bring Northern Irish partners on board in the future. So what does this all mean for patients? Well, ultimately, the end game is to have new therapies for people living with rare disease in Ireland. But clinical trials take a while and, um, you know, it can take a lot of time for that, for those new therapies to be approved and to be reimbursed. So in the meantime, the objective really is to have more access to rare disease clinical trials for patients. And that means that patients will have opportunities then to have access to these world um, innovative new treatments um, for their patient for, for themselves, but also opportunities to influence the research and to kind of set the priorities in terms of what outcomes we should be working towards. And um, it's also going to build collaborations across different stakeholders and countries, as Avril already mentioned, all of the work that's happening in Europe around um, the part European Partnership and also the uh, European Reference Network. So we're really trying to connect in with the work that's happening there. And then in terms of all of that, it's going to raise the profile for rare disease research in Ireland. So apologies, this is a very busy slide, but I just really wanted to kind of get the point across that uh, a lot of the activity we've been doing over the past year is linked into the different work packages that we have within the network. So I've just included the work packages there in the coloured boxes on the right hand corner. So we have um, governance, data, methodology and training, PPI and impact. Now, for the purposes of this talk and in the interest of time, I'm only going to focus on PPI and impact, but I just want to say that um, underpinning all of the activities that we're doing in the network is really that relationship building piece. And it's really important that we are raising awareness of what we're doing in the network and trying to build those contacts with the community, understand their needs, and how we can work together. And I think that's obviously something Lorna and Stacey have both spoken about, really kind of building those rela relationships is key. Um, I actually just want to draw your attention to three pieces that might be relevant for this um, talk tonight as well. So we have a conference planned for um, the 29th of February next year, and that's to coincide with International Rare Disease Day. Um, so it's open for everybody and you'll hear a lot more about that in the next six months. Um, we also are working really hard on our new website. So hopefully that will be launched in the next month. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the next few slides. Um, and also we have a mailing list now as well. And we're hoping to send out our first newsletter next week. So you can follow our journey as we're going through this. Um, and I'll pop the link into the chat after this talk. So moving on, hold on, duck, oh, there we go. Okay, so moving on to um, PPI, I suppose the good thing about coming at the end of this is that everybody who spoke before me set a really nice um, foundation for what I want to talk about, so I don't really need to go into the ins and outs of how what PPI is and, and how it's done. We're really going to focus on our strategy for embedding it across the network but I just really wanted to include this slide here to just reiterate again how important PPI is in the prioritization design and conduct of rare disease clinical trials um, this is not the these are not the only reasons why it's important but just a few that I've picked out is firstly that it enhances the quality relevance and impact of the rare disease research making sure that the research is addressing outcomes that matter most to patients like we heard um, and actually there was a in the chat there I think a comment popped up that it's not necessarily looking for a cure but you know looking for something that will improve the quality of life can be like you know, obviously life-changing for people as well and um, the second point is that PPI improves patient access to trials so pay patients are more likely to sign up to a trial if they've been involved in helping to design it so they've actually been considered in how it's going to run and work and also 
through PPI, they're more likely to be aware of the trial and share that among their networks as well. And um, the third point then is that it ensures information is shared in an easily accessible way with people that are most likely to be impacted by it. So that's pretty self-explanatory. And then um, it also leverages the strength of Irish patient advocates to influence regulatory decisions and reimbursement. And when it comes to reimbursement, uh, the decisions are made based on unmet need. And so if you include PPI in the design and the prioritization of the research, then you're ensuring that it is actually going to address an unmet need and so have value. So I think that that's a really key piece because there's no point in doing the research if the, ultimately the therapies are not going to get to the patient. Um, so what's our strategy? Obviously, it's quite ambitious. We want to embed PPI across the right, network. Simone, I just want to give you a time check. Okay, perfect. I only have, I think, two more slides, so I'm okay. Um, okay, so we want to embed PPI fully across the network. Um, and our long-term long vision really is to see where we're going to have like a really true collaboration of rare disease organizations and networks. PPI is going to be fully incorporated into the trial design and management. It's going to have continuous improvement in education. So in terms of how we're doing it, how we're training researchers, we're building PPI into the knowledge exchange activities. So, you know, the PPI contributors are going to be equal partners so they're going to be named on the research papers they're going to be presenting at the conferences with us and it's going to be a true partnership but in the short term how do we do that so we need to start by establishing a group of people that are going to work with us and help us to design what this is going to look like so delving into that a little bit deeper then where do we start so again it's all about building relationships so we're, we're working with the rare disease organizations and networks, collaborating with them, getting to know them, and also enhancing that patient and public engagement. So raising awareness about what we're doing through our external activities. So, you know, having our website, increasing our social media activity, having our newsletter, and then talking at events like this and having meet and greets at different um, events as well. And ultimately, through doing all of that, we hope to recruit a pool of PPI contributors. And Sandra, it was great that you said there um, that, you know, OK, Stacey has loads of experience and is really embedded in what she's doing in the PPI space. But, you know, for people who just start out, it doesn't have to be like that level of, of involvement. So what we want to do is really have a very diverse pool, understanding that people have different interests, different um availabilities and even different starting points so ultimately there would be a lot of different types of opportunities that people would have it could be just in being involved in one particular standalone project it could be you know it being in a priority setting workshop or it could be longer term commitments like sitting on a patient advisory group for a couple of years potentially sitting on a steering committee so you're involved in the governance of how we're running the network so there's lots of different activities or options there we haven't kind of figured out what it's going to look like yet and hopefully we that will evolve as we work with the contributors so i just want to give a really quick sneak peek here of our website that we're developing and just to bookmark um rare disease research.ie is going to be our um domain once we get it up and running so keep an eye out for that um, and hopefully it's going to be your one-stop shop for everything to do with rare disease trials in ireland so this is my last slide <laughs> Um, so next step, if this sounds like something you'd be interested in getting involved in, send me an email. So it's siobhan.hendrick1 at ucd.ie. Um, again, I said, really want to be inclusive and diverse. So we just want to kind of work like work with where you're at and, and kind of figure out who's interested and kind of gauge the appetite for that so that we can see what those opportunities are going to look like. Um, unfortunately, because we don't officially have partners in Northern Ireland at this point, we're not looking for contributors from the north, but that may change. So if you are interested, I would I would encourage you to join our network. Just you can scan the QR code there or I'll drop the link into the chat. And that way you'll follow our journey along or follow us on Twitter at rare underscore trials. And uh, same if you're not fully sure if you want to get involved at this stage, but you'd like to learn a little bit more, just join our network instead of reaching out to me at this stage. And that's it. Thank you. Um, thanks, Siobhan. That was great. It's really good to see that coming. I've, I've seen bits on Twitter and bits here, there and in various emails and stuff. So it's great to see it in, in that format. Um, 
and I would encourage, I also encourage, you know, kind of rare disease network about strategic partners to sometimes look outside the box and, and not just looking at, you know, medical partners or patients, but actually looking at like a community work Ireland or National Youth Council of Ireland or Spaces Pave Point, um, you know, Epic or Empower to to work with with these and because these are the key people to to build relationships with with maybe underrepresented groups within these within these research spaces. So maybe looking outside the box for those partnerships, um, yeah, is is really is really um impactful. And um, so I hope I don't know who's still with us, but I hope you're all still with us. But we're, we're just coming kind of coming into the end of our space. For this evening but what we're, we're going to bring in um rose rosalind callahan she's a person who who lives with with lived experience of a rare disease and she's also a, a, another powerhouse on the on the rare disease steering forum who i have the privilege to work with in that space and i've, I've really enjoyed working with her over the last because i think we we share the same values and knowledge around how to work with people and advocacy and she's going to bring in some reflections of this evening and, and answer some of those questions that was in the chat. Um, so welcome, Rosalind, to the space. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, we do have a few questions that I'm going to address to the panel. But first of all, in terms of reflections about this evening's event, absolutely marvellous. Um, I first heard the phrase, rare disease over 40 years ago, where it was a phrase that not many people used. I mean, how far have we come to be having a meeting like this this evening? So while there are many, many challenges and many, many hurdles to overcome, the progress in my lifetime has been absolutely phenomenal. And I would like to thank everybody who is in this field, uh, patients, researchers, scientists, absolutely everybody. I'm reflections this evening. I'm all the more conscious of the people who have made comments about having an ultra rare disease. So we'll put that into our notes, uh, maybe something for us or for everybody to to explore further. Uh, I saw that as a, as a real a uh, wake up call for me. It was something that I hadn't considered. And, you know, there are so many practical difficulties with being a patient with the lived in experience. But I really do believe that a lot of work needs to be done to address the mental health of people and their families living with a rare condition. I'm a pretty tough old bird in many, many ways. But when I received my formal diagnosis, I can tell you, I felt absolutely alone and didn't know where to turn for help and didn't know who to speak to. And, you know, with with the proper work and effort, hopefully no one else will be in that position again in, in the future. Um, so one of the questions that we do have this evening came from Elliot, and if I could address this to Avril, I'm just conscious of time that we don't have a lot of time to open it up to all of the panellists, but some thoughts on the benefits of research or getting involved in research if there are only one or two people who have a condition. Avril? Yeah, thanks, Rosaline. I mean, I... There's no question that that's challenging in terms of making research happen when it's ultra rare, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It absolutely does. It happens in so, there's great research in so many ultra rare conditions. I think there's a couple of things to, to think about it. it. It's the first thing is maybe information, trying to find the other people and it has to be international. When you're talking ultra rare, it has to be international finding other people living with the same condition, finding clinicians and researchers who are interested in it. The Orphanet website is a very good place to start with that. Um, and then sometimes researchers in the broader field can help with that as well. And, and then I guess 
what I've seen most often is it there's champions that lead the way. Now, sometimes that champion is a parent or or a person living with the condition themselves, and sometimes often in in ultra rare, it's it's a a, a clinician who has seen firsthand the need and has an interest in research and is willing to do something about it. Um, there's no straightforward answer to that one, I'm afraid, but I, I wish you the very best to luck with it. Okay, thank you, Avril. And then Elia talks about, you know, the burden of being involved with PPI. So if I could address this question to Stacey and uh, respect Stacey for everything that you do. And if I could just say before I ask the question, on reflections, I think there is work to be done for people who wish to become involved to have a bit of training and be aware of those of those. Um, and I would ask your question about how how much of a how do we how do we address the amount of time and effort that may be involved. How do we deal with organisations or people that ask for too much of us? particularly some of us are, are trying to earn a living as well. So what would you, would you have a suggestion about the burden of being involved with PPI? Well, Rosaline, that's a question. <laughs> so that's a is. question. Um, and I suppose uh, the other slides I had gone into was around the educational aspect of PPI, and I'm happy for those to be distributed to the audience. I suppose education has been a huge journey, part of my journey to being where I am today. And I'd like to thank IPOSI. I'm an IPOSI um, education graduate and I'm a member of the UPATI National Platform, but also UDRUS, the European Rare Disease um, Organization has played an important role for me also, because I um, have done some of their training to fully understand um, the complexities around research in the rare to disease space. Um, and there's links in the, the slides for people to look in at, at those. Um, but I wouldn't be where I am today without training. Um, but your training gave me a voice. Um, it gave me the ability to go into different rooms and put my hand up and have the confidence to be able to speak. And it also gave me the, the critical thinking skills to be able to see things differently um, and question um, researchers. Um, are they doing the right thing or could they do it better? And that's probably why I'm known as a troublemaker in a wagon at times, because that, that is what I have done. In relation to the burden, I suppose I'm very dedicated to my own time. Um, there is times when I call it silly season and things happen. Um, the month of May and, and the month of October, you'll get asked to 101 things because um, universities are back and they put everything in in a space of two or three weeks. And um, so those are silly seasons. But I cannot. I have many health conditions. I don't have the ability to 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 do all the things that they will want me to to do. So I say no. Um, and that has been a very big learning curve for me because if I don't say no, I, I'm putting myself in jeopardy health-wise and my time and my energy is limited. So the time that I give, I, I, I want it to be respected in this space. Um, but there is people that are really overburned, burdened, but you have to have strict rules with yourselves. And, you know, I suppose the reason why I do it outweighs some of the things that, um, I'm, I'm asked, but I, I'm here to make a difference and use my voice as best possible to make a difference. But PPI has brought great things to my life. It allows me to learn each and every day something new. It allows me to be at the forefront of research and to ensure that if I can have better outcomes for myself or my family members, but also it has brought great meaning and purpose to my life because I found myself in a space where I became unemployed and then having to bring myself back from ground zero back to where I am today, um, where I now have the confidence, whether it's walking with crutches or in a wheelchair, to go into rooms and be able to speak freely and openly. And, and that took a lot, of, a lot of courage and a big journey. And there's been a lot of people that have supported me along that journey. 
but everything has started with conversation. And a lot of my time is spent having conversations with people. And have you thought about this? And there's so many amazing people on this virtual call tonight that they have great journeys um, and that really needs to be shared. And their experience is their expertise. So don't be worrying about knowing all the things that I've gone out to learn. You start with where you are and you have so much experience that they will want to listen to you. Stacey, thank you very much for that. And uh, you know, just to touch on to a question that we'll need to address at, at another time, you know, how do we encourage other people to get involved? in research you know some people are more timid or they're shy and and don't and think that they're not good enough all of those sort of problems and uh, Anna's also made an excellent comment in the chat that while all this is going on we I believe we always need to be cognizant that there are so many parts to living with a rare condition and and sometimes for us I can say as a patient that the, the basic services, the, the basic standards are not being met, you know, particularly with the, the silos where, you know, you're seeing all the different specialists and nobody's joining the dots. So there's a lot of work to be done on the ground. And obviously as somebody uh, involved in PPI myself, I think there is great magic in the patient's Okay, so what we are going to do is you guys are going to get a chance now to give some feedback. I know there's been a great amount of chat uh, in the chat function, but this is uh, going to just let us kind of see 
where the barriers to participation in research are and also um, where you're finding out your information about how to get involved in the first place. OK, so just while you're all logging in, um, I'm just going to go ahead with the first question and let you have a think about how you want to put in your answers. So I suppose I want to preface this a little bit by saying that we completely acknowledge and understand that not everybody who is living with a rare disease has the capacity or even the interest in being directly involved in health research. There's there's no uh, assumption here that you are currently involved or that you're going to be involved. But regardless, we're very interested in hearing your perspective. Um, so the first question there, I'm hoping you can see. If you are a person with lived experience of rare disease, where would you or where did you go for information on getting involved in rare disease research? OK, and you can see the answers popping up there already, which is brilliant. Oh, tons. Look at this. Google, Rare Disease Ireland. Fantastic. They're on the call and they're also on the steering group for the Rare Disease Forum. The Rare Disease Office. Absolutely. Twitter is an interesting one, actually. I wouldn't have thought Twitter. For information, I go to NIH website or PubMed. Oh, very good. OK. Now yeah, I'm trying to actually see my answers. To others that have been down this road. Yeah, absolutely. 100 uh, percent. Oh, how lovely. No idea before tonight and now rare disease research. Ie. Oh, Siobhan, you did very well on your presentation. We're getting the word out there. That's fantastic. So I suppose with this question, we're thinking, is there a person that you would turn to? Is there an organization you turn to a particular health research charity, for example, or a website? Um, we have Facebook groups as well, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Through social media calls. And patient support groups. Such a wide range there. Listening tonight is my first attempt to get involved. I had no idea at all where to start. Google support forums for my condition. Absolutely. University. Oh, fantastic. OK, and then directly to patient organisations. OK, I would definitely encourage anyone um, to get in contact with our members and all of the, the health research charities uh, that are working across Ireland. There are so many of them. Um, OK, I think that's 34 answers. Let's fly on to the next question because I know we're running a bit late. OK, so thinking about being involved in the planning and design of health research, what are the barriers to participating for people living with rare disease? Now, I'm sure there's plenty of answers on this one. I guess we're thinking around, do you feel that you have the capacity? Do you feel that you have enough knowledge? I know it's been emphasized here a lot tonight that everyone starts somewhere and that obviously, you know, as time goes by, you might be interested in, in getting into training and things like that. But again, you are the patient, so you are the expert in your own condition because you know better than anyone what it is to live with it. Um, also, things like comfort with technology and um, ability in terms of uh, your comfort in literacy or numeracy, uh, location of research uh, or research centers, maybe if issues around the costs that are involved. Uh, let's see what's coming up. The burden of the illness itself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's it's. It's massive having no energy. Yeah, 100%. So many answers coming in. Hang on. Being a full time family carer and time to participate, accessible times to participate. Absolutely. So many people saying time and energy. Absolutely. 
technology is a barrier to entry to some training may help. That's definitely an interesting one. GDPR has been a barrier for our family in getting information, shared experience and knowledge. That's very interesting. What we're going to do with these answers, just so you know, is obviously you've heard from Shamal Hendrick there earlier. Um, so she's going to be using this in her work. And we're also going to be, as the Rare Disease Forum uh, steering group and also in HRCI, we're going to be using this for our own advocacy to try and push forward better conditions for uh, people with lived experience of rare disease who want to get involved in rare disease research because, you know, these are very um, tough barriers. So many about time and energy, time constraints, absolutely limited by the condition, 100%. Not being reimbursed for time given, that's, that's definitely one that we talk about a lot in HRCI. We absolutely believe that if you are giving up your time, giving up your energy, Folks, thank you so much. I'm going to go back to uh, Sandra. It's a great tool to collect that data. So then that data then can be shared with PPI, um, you know, collaborators, people people who are setting up PPI kind of research spaces. Um, so it's really good to have that. So then we can we can make space then and make arrangements and, and set a scene then for people to get more involved and, and kind of work with people where they're at. So tonight, I know it's we've heard a lot of information, a lot of really valuable, rich information here tonight, and it's been exceptionally good. So I hope people found it interesting. I hope some of that um nuances around oh I, I'm I'm not I can't get involved I don't know what to do and I'm I may not have the knowledge that I hope that was kind of cleared away from you and um, but just to reinforce somebody who has is living with a rare disease that actually one of the best and biggest tools we have in our toolbox is our voice and our participation um, and I think that will be the key to transformative change, whether it's on an individual basis or for the people coming behind us, because rare diseases will be alive long before after we long before us and after we go. So to change, change the, the path and way of this. So it's it's been a pleasure to chair tonight's event. And um, it was it's a force for me to chair an event in this in these spaces. So and um, it was great to be in here and, and a lot of knowledge shared. And um, so I hope you got um, something from it. And please do keep in touch. Please do reach out. If you're interested, get involved. Let us know how the how to's. And yeah, that's it. Have a nice. Thank you.